Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, Cupid. I know you had lunch and probably a little sleepy. You were partying last night, so we're going to try to rock the house this afternoon. How's that? Okay. Are you fired up? Oh, come on. You can do better than that. Are you fired up? Is Cupid in the house? Okay, all right. Well, I am so proud to be here in Vancouver, proud to be bringing greetings from the 1.6 million members, your sisters and brothers in the United States, members of AFSCME, from Alaska to Puerto Rico, who share your passion, who share your activism for protecting vital public services. Now, let me start off by saying this. I want to pay tribute to a good friend of mine, tribute to a, a brother, to a leader. Matter of fact, your leader, National President Paul Moyes. Give him a round of applause for his commitment and his dedication to working families all across Canada and around the world. Now, Paul has been an outspoken leader not only for the members of this union, but for economic justice and fairness for all working families on either side of the border. And Paul, just to make sure you're always connected, connected to my union, connected to AFSCME, I have a little something for you. I want you to stand up and I want to present a couple of things to you, all right? All right. Now this first, it's not a credit card, okay? <laughs> I'm sorry it's not a credit card. It is an honorary lifetime membership. He is joining AFSCME today. Is that okay? Honorary membership of AFSCME. Okay. I got some other gifts for you. Now, I know it gets cold. In fact, it's a little chilly out here today, but it gets cold <laughs> in Canada. And we've got some nice jackets back in the States when it gets cold. AFSCME jackets. Now, I hope you don't mind. I know you've got your your QP jackets. Oh, there's two of them in here, in case you lose one. Okay? Let me pull this apart. He's going to put it on. He did this at our convention, too. How's this look? AFSCME's in the house. How's this look? Okay? Congratulations, brother. Thank you. You know, Paul spoke. Some of you know this. He spoke at our National Union Convention last year in Chicago. And I remember when I was in Toronto, I guess it was around last year this time, speaking to your National Sector Conference, I told a story about Paul being in Chicago at our convention. We have around 6,000 people who attend our biannual convention. We had a Southern Baptist minister who was speaking at our convention. His name is Reverend Barber, started the Moral Monday movement in the United States. And he can deliver a sermon. And he preached to those 6,000 folks in attendance at the AFSCME convention. Must have preached for about 45 minutes to an hour. Unfortunately, the person that had to follow him was Paul. <laughs> I felt kind of bad. Felt kind of sorry. But sisters and brothers, let me tell you this. When Paul got up to that podium, he started preaching too, and he delivered a sermon that day. He delivered a sermon that day at that AFSCME convention. He talked truth to power. Give him another round of applause for standing tall every single day. And I've got to say, I was sitting, sitting here yesterday. Didn't he light up the hall yesterday with his speech? I tell you, I thought that speech that he gave was great. Now right now, we all need to have Paul's fire because sisters and brothers, there is so much, so much at stake. At the federal and provincial levels in Canada, politicians are always going after public services, just like they're doing in America. There are groups that want to destroy you and their enthusiasm does not wane no matter who is in office. You know, they're like, they're like zombies in bad horror movies. They keep coming back 
and coming back and coming back. In America, in the United States, we're faced with the same kinds of battles, the same kinds of fights, folks trying to take collective bargaining away from us, privatized public services, retirement security is in jeopardy. You feel it. We feel it every single day. So we're, we're attacking governors. We're going after them. We're going after state legislatures who are not supporting working families in our country. But now we've got a new actor who's involved in really what we're about and what we're able to do. The United States Supreme Court has decided that they're going to accept a case that will be heard the beginning of next year with a decision coming out as early as April of 2016, no later than June of 2016. This case is called Friedrichs versus the California Teachers Association. They want to make it about union dues, how if you don't want to be a member and you don't want to pay union dues, then you don't have to, although you receive the same level of benefits. They're trying to do that in the public sector in our country. But this case, sisters and brothers, it really isn't about union dues. This case attacks our ability to have a, a seat at the table. It attacks our ability to bargain collectively for public service workers in the United States. This case attacks our very right to exist. We had a preview of Friedrichs last year in a case that challenged the right of child care and home care workers to organize. They're paid by government money, government funds, and they were challenged. And the right to join a union was taken away taken away from them. The court made it much more challenging to organize and represent these workers, the same Supreme Court that is now considering a case, Friedrichs, that could damage us, damage public service unions in our country enormously. Well, sisters and brothers, let me tell you something, and I give you this commitment as the president of AFSCME. We're not going to let any governor, we aren't going to let any state legislature, and we damn sure aren't going to let any court decide what we are about and what we must do to protect our members and to protect working families. We, we have come too far. All of us have fought too hard to turn back now. So I'm announcing it today, and I've done it yesterday, and I'll do it again tomorrow. If our enemies want to fight, let me tell you something, sisters and brothers, they've got one with AFSCME, and they've got a fight with CUPE. Yeah, yeah. That's what this is all about. It's about standing up and making your voices heard. Now, one of our most persistent enemies in the States probably heard his name. He's the governor out of Wisconsin. His name is Scott Walker. He is like Stephen Harper on steroids. Okay? I mean, just remember, remember what Scott Walker did to our union in Wisconsin. That is the state where AFSCME was born in 1932, where state workers fought for the right to have collective bargaining, to have a seat at the table. Scott Work Walker stole our voices away from us, took collective bargaining away from us in that state. Now, some of you joined us all the way from Canada. You came down to Wisconsin, and you marched with us. You rallied with us, but it just wasn't us. It was farmers. It was retirees. It was students. It was owners of small business. It was the trade union movement. It was the faith-based community all coming together 
to protest what Walker was trying to do. As some of you may remember, that in one of his speeches, he said that he was able to take on 100,000 protesters in the state of Wisconsin, in Madison. As a matter of fact, he even called the protesters terrorists. And he said that if he can take on 100,000 protester, protesters, peaceful protesters in Wisconsin, that he can take on ISIS around the world. That's what he said. He compared those peaceful protesters to ISIS, to a terrorist organization. Well, you know what? Scott Walker can go straight to hell. Now, all of you know, for just a little while, Scott Walker was a presidential candidate in my country. He wanted to spread his gospel of being anti-worker, anti-union, anti-public service. Well, I am so proud to report to you, and you already know this, that he didn't last too long. He's not running for president anymore. He is back in Wisconsin. And I'm glad to report to you that the only way that Scott Walker will get close to that White House is if he stands in line with everybody else visiting the White House. He will never be living there. Never be living there. Now, the week that, the week that he dropped out, I had the I had the ability to be at the White House. And I met, along with a lot of other folks, we met the Pope coming into the White House with President Obama. Now, you know, Pope Francis was there and it was so uplifting, so uplifting to be in his presence, to listen to him talk about supporting and helping the poor, supporting working families. He was talking about forgiveness all over the world. Well, I've got to tell you, as far as Scott Walker is concerned, I guess I need to go to confession. <laughs> and I'm not even Catholic, but I think I need to go to confession. <laughs> because I got to tell you, I have fun trashing Scott Walker, and I am going to keep on kicking him and kicking him and kicking him until he is no longer governor in the state of Wisconsin. That's what all of us have got to do. We've got to re-energize ourselves. We've got to rededicate ourselves. We've got to fight like hell. That's it. The time is now. The time is now! Now, now these attacks, these attacks aren't only in Washington, D.C., and Wisconsin, and in states across my country, but they're here in Canada also. Now, I hear that Justin Trudeau and the Liberals have pledged to repeal Bills C-377 and C-525. If they do, well, let me say this. When they do, all of us, you and AFSCME and all working people will be celebrating that. It would send a message to the Scott Walkers of the world that what they have done is only temporary. It would send a message that no matter what, no matter how long we fight, no matter how many prime ministers or governors or presidents come and go, our unions, AFSCME, will continue to stand tall. CUPE will continue, continue to stand tall. That is who we are. That's what we fight about every single day. We will never give in. We will never give up. We'll be around when they are all long gone. In the state of New Mexico, a few years ago when a previous governor killed collective bargaining, your sisters and brothers in AFSCME, we hung in, we fought back, we organized, 
and we won our rights back. We didn't give up in Kentucky. We stayed in Kentucky. We hung in, we fought back, we organized. And we won our rights back. And we didn't give up in Puerto Rico, where we even called a strike that shut down that island. And the same governor who took collective bargaining away from us came back to the table and he signed collective bargaining for public services once again. Cupy, that's what solidarity, that's what solidarity can do. Coming together like never before. So I say to all the extremist politicians in Canada, the United States, and around the globe, wherever you are, when you're gone, we will remain. We've got to be a, a strong force, not only for our members, but for working families in Canada and across the United States. It is up to us. We have got to accept that challenge. But it's not going to be easy. Accepting that challenge means that the first thing that we must do is to re-examine ourselves re-examine what we are doing institutionally. Looking at ourselves and figuring out what we're doing right and continuing that. But also looking at what we're doing wrong and fixing it. That's what AFSCME has been engaged with for the past two years. We brought our leadership together all over the country brought them together and talked about the challenges that our union faces, the attacks on collective bargaining or retirement security or dues checkoff or public services. And we decided that it wasn't business as usual. We had to get back to basics. Now we're a big union, 1.6 million members strong. But we decided to do one thing. We decided that we needed to recommit ourselves and rededicate ourselves to, to organizing, not only externally, but internally. We made the decision that we had to throw away those iPhones and those iPads, and we had to get down to basics. And getting down to basics means talking with people, one-on-one, one-on-one <laughs> on one at the work site, even knocking on their doors at home, talking to them about the importance of them being involved in their union. Every affiliate in AFSCME has pledged to engage in this program. Let me tell you some of the results since 2014. In January 2014, along with this program, we decided that we were going to organize internally, internally, 50,000 new members by the time we marched into Chicago at our convention in June of 2014. The National Union, every com affiliate committed, committed to this program. We called it 50,000 Stronger. Well, sisters and brothers, six months later when we marched into Chicago, we weren't 50,000 Stronger, we were 92,000 Stronger. <laughs> And we didn't stop there. We kept the program going. And I think you heard Paul mention this yesterday. But as of yesterday, and it's probably grown a little bit more, but AFSCME is 200,000 stronger within our great union. That took commitment, dedication, not being afraid to make changes, not being afraid to go back to basics. This isn't rocket science. This is one-on-one -on -one organizing, talking with people, looking at them dead in the eye, listening to them while they listen to you. So now we've graduated. We've got a new program now called Ask Me Strong. We've got a convention coming up in Las Vegas in July of 2016. And one of the goals that we've set 
is that we're going to talk to 80% of our membership one-on-one. -on -one. That's one million members. One million members. Now folks are saying, are you nuts? That can't be done. If you set your mind to anything, it can be done. We didn't think that we would achieve that 50,000, but we did. We surpassed it. And we're going to talk to those members because we want them to be reconnected with their union. I think Paul says this all the time. I mean, and I say it. We've got activists that will give their lives to QP, give their lives to AFSCME. But most of our members are not activists. It doesn't make them bad people. They've just got full plates. They're good trade unionists, but we can't ignore them. We've got to talk to them. We've got to engage them. They have got to feel a part of their union. This is not Paul's union. This is not my union. This is your union. This is their union. So we're engaged in talking with our members working with them, we're training our activists, we're training our volunteer member organizers to go to those work sites, knock on those doors, communicate to members and non-members alike. That's the first stool. The second stool is this, the second leg of the stool is this. We can't engage in this battle by ourselves. In the United States, 35% of the public sector is organized. That's why we have a bullet on our backs, a bullseye on our backs. They want to take that away from us. In the private sector, in the United States, 6.5%. Unhealthy. We can't have a powerful labor movement without increasing the numbers in the private sector in our country. So we can't engage in this fight. The entire trade union movement in the United States cannot engage in this fight by ourselves. We've got to reconnect and rebuild our relationships with our community allies, with our coalition partners, just as you do in Canada. But let me give you a, a warning, because we do it a lot and we're trying to change. So many times when we'll have a struggle, and we'll have a battle, and we'll go out and we'll seek support from those outside of AFSCME, outside of the trade union movement, and they come and engage, they come and help us, they come and support us, but once that battle is over, we get amnesia. And we forget about engaging in their battles. It doesn't work that way. It's got to be a two-way street. If they stand up for us, we've got to stand up for them. Simple as that. You know, sisters and brothers, we can only win for our members and working families if all of us, if all of us are a part of the fight. We can only win if all of us stand up together. We can only win if all of us make our voices heard together. I mean, look at the proud history. Look at the proud history of both of our unions. Those who came before us sacrificed. They sacrificed for our rights. They fought for our rights. They bled for our rights. They went to jail for our rights and in their honor, for our children and for our grandchildren. And this is becoming more important to me because I'm a new granddad. My first grandson was born a couple of months ago. His name is Ben. It's given me a different kind of perspective. And that perspective is that I'll be damned if I let anybody take his rights away from him. I'm not gonna let it happen. All of us have got to fight for those rights. We must protect those rights. You know, we stand on a proud legacy of warriors within our unions, within AFSCME, within CUPE, who have done just that. Some of you know the story. 
1968, city of Memphis, Tennessee, in the Deep South, 1,300 African-American sanitation workers started protesting and marching. And they went on strike. And they carried signs that said, I'm a man, because they were being disrespected and mistreated on the job. They didn't have any rights. They didn't have a seat at the table. And they risked their lives in 1968 in Memphis, Tennessee, and they went on strike. And Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. traveled to Memphis to support that strike because he understood the connection between economic rights, civil rights, labor rights, human rights. You bring all of those together. And he gave his life in support of those 1,300 sanitation workers, AFSCME members. But you know what? They stood tall. They were strong. And they didn't give in. And they won that strike, and they got a seat at the table. That is AFSCME strong. That is AFSCME strong. Right here. Right here, I can tell so many stories about CUPE being CUPE strong. In 1978, 14,000 hospital workers in Ontario joined an illegal strike to win respect, to gain dignity. They believed so deeply in their cause, they even defied a back-to-work order. Members were fined. CUPE's president went to jail. And the top leader of this union said this, and I quote, every minute is in jail is worth it when you are defending basic trade union rights. Every minute in jail is worth it. And CUPE emerged from that strike stronger and more powerful. Those hospital workers, Sisters and brothers, those hospital workers were CUPE strong. I was watching yesterday when Paul called up all the strikers over the past couple of years who risked their jobs, but they stood for something. They stood for themselves. They stood for public service. They stood for their communities. They stood for their families, and they won those strikes. You should be proud because they were CUPE strong. They were CUPE strong. No matter, no matter, no matter what our struggles, we emerge stronger. And today that struggle continues. We can't be divided. We can't let them play that game with us. That's what they like to do, divide and conquer. Pit one group against the other. Pit the private sector versus the public sector. Pit union against union. Pit member against member. We cannot fall for that game. We've got to speak out. And the only way that we do that is to speak out together. We must speak out together for wages that sustain families. We must speak out together for fairness and equity. We must speak out together for retirement security. We must speak out together for the vital public services that every community depends on in Canada and the United States. We must speak out together. We must speak out from the Yukon to New Brunswick, from Washington State to Florida. We must speak out. We are rising up together for all the working families, for all the working men and women that make our nation's great. We are rising up together. So together, 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 we will build a strong Canada. We will build a strong America. Together we will fight our battles. Together we will celebrate our victories. We are AFSCME. We are QP.
unity, in solidarity, we are together. God bless you. Thank you very much. Lee Saunders. Lee Saunders. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.